welcome to the Jet Setter Show, where we explore lifestyle-friendly destinations worldwide. Enjoy and learn from a variety of experts on topics ranging from upscale travel at wholesale prices to retiring overseas, to global real estate and business opportunities, to tax havens and expatriate opportunities. You'll get great ideas on unique cultures, causes, and cruise vacations. Whether you're wealthy or just want to live a wealthy lifestyle, The Jet Setter Show is for you. Here's your host, Jason Hartman. Welcome to The Jet Setter Show. This is Jason Hartman, your host, where we explore lifestyle-friendly destinations worldwide. I think you'll enjoy the interview we have for you today, and we will be back with that in less than 60 seconds here on The Jet Setter Show. It's my pleasure to welcome James Archer to the show. He is the Director of Investments for Live and Invest Overseas, and he's coming to us today from Panama City. James, welcome. How are you? Hi, Jason. Thank you for having me. I'm very well. How are you? Doing well, thanks. What are you up to nowadays? Uh, you've got uh, several projects that you're marketing in, uh, in the greater Panama area, I guess. Yeah, so we, we've got opportunities um, across the globe, really. We have some in Panama um, and other parts of Latin America, Colombia, Brazil, um, even some in Europe in places like France as well. So a varied selection. Um, so what we're trying to do really is offer our clients a diversification of potential projects uh, that they can invest in or obviously residencies for themselves um, in various countries. And, and, you know, these are secular opportunities. They're not from our portfolio as such. Um, but what we do do is we carry out due diligence on behalf of our readers um, for those projects and then give an unbiased view on those projects to our readers. So it allows us to do some of the legwork, if you like, for our clients. Okay. And so now why do you say it's on, unbiased? Well, the main reason that I would say that is obviously from, from our perspective, um, you know, it doesn't make a difference to us um, whether it's X project or Y project that people are interested in necessarily investing. What, what we really focus on, and I, I'd like to call us right, really rather than sales team, is, is a consultative team. So our focus is finding out what uh, any given person, and, and I'll use investments as the example, but any given person, what their goals are for their portfolio and what they're looking for and then offering solutions to that um, and allowing them to make the decision. So tell us about uh, some of the projects that you're recommending now. Sure. Well, we've got some very interesting projects at the moment and some, some interesting ones coming up as well. Uh, one of the ones I really like at the moment as an income play is in the agricultural sector in Panama. Um, so it's actually a mango um, plantation opportunity in Panama. I really like it because it goes for 60 to 80 years. So there's a constant income. Um, you hold the hard, hard asset because you own the title to the land. And then it offers an income and, and the developer makes their profits through the harvest of sharing those profits with you. So they take 30% and you take 70% as the investor. I really like that one. Panama is you know, not only a booming market, but with a canal, it's, it's ideal for things like agriculture. Um, we also have an interesting project in Brazil, which is a, a quick in and out, if you like. Uh, it's a 12-month investment and that offers returns of uh, about 15% after 12 months. Um, now, it's not underwritten as such, but it is guaranteed within the contracts. But we are also bringing on another project as well, similar to that um, in Panama, which is underwritten by an insurance company, um, which offers the same thing. But that's got a, up to a three-year in and out sort of investment. And then we have Los Lotes, which is actually our own project, um, which is in the, the Azuero Peninsula of Panama, a beautiful part of the country. And that's more for people looking at end residencies. There are some capital appreciation possibilities in there as well. So there's a varied mix. I mean, I could go on for hours, to be honest, Jason, but there's certainly a, a good selection that we have across the globe. Yeah, okay. So, you know, maybe at a given time, we'll, we'll come back to the, uh, you know, the agricultural stuff. I just want to talk a little bit more about just the basic residential stuff, uh, you know, for, for income property especially. What, what type of stuff do you have there? Well, we've got a mixed thing, mixed types of projects. We have some in Panama. Um, there's a hotel condo opportunity, for example, in Panama City, where, again, if you're looking for something that's turnkey, you know, you don't want to have much hassle or thought process to it, then it's an ideal opportunity 
to, to invest in something where it's fully managed um, by a hotel operator that have a history across the world um, in investing in hotels, specifically from Colombia, actually, I should say, and convention centers. Then we have Losses Lotters, which is more directed towards, I wouldn't say it's a, it's a rental um, opportunity as such, although I'm sure it will be in the future, but really that's where you're buying the land and, and building your sort of ideal home in paradise, if you like, um, and, and place that people can use as a holiday home or if they're looking to reside in Panama. And in Colombia, you know, we have opportunities in Colombia with some developers that we work with there. There's some rental opportunities. In... Are, are these all condos? Um, not all of them. So the Losses Lotes, our own one, is um, for housing. So it's houses you can build. We will be doing condos ourselves on the project. Um, it will house eventually around 5,000 people. So it's a fairly substantial project. So what we're doing is the infrastructure. Um, right. But that one, I think Leaf talked about that right, on the okay. show. That's yeah. not really for investment though, right? No, no. That's more for the, for the end user. Um, yeah. From the investment side, um, we do have some housing projects in Mexico, um, but generally it tends to be condos, and that's not by accident. It's more based on the fact that there's less need for, for maintenance, and it's more turnkey when you're dealing with condos um, than you are when you're dealing with housing um, as such, or houses, I should say, um, because of the fact that obviously it's got its own maintenance happening in the building. There's a security company overseeing the building in many in instances. So it offers a bit more security to investors, and it offers potential for short-term and long-term rents and gives you a bit of a wider audience um, to, to... You know why I just can't make this whole investing overseas concept work? And I, God knows I've looked, James. I mean, I've been to 71 countries. I've looked at real estate in so many of them. And, and I keep looking. I keep liking this idea, but I can't, I can't make it work. And I'll tell you why. The, the reason I can't make it work is because I just don't know who the rental pool is. Like, where really are the renters? We're not going to rent these properties to locals. They, they just don't have the money. And there are some expats. Uh, you know, a lot of expats are, I guess, they're renting, buying. Uh, they're doing different stuff. But it's a relatively small market, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question, Jason. And, and you know, many people, many of our readers feel the same way. Um, it can be confusing. And I think before even looking, and, and you, you've approached that in completely the right way, that before even looking at a particular condo or a particular development, you've got to understand the country, um, its demographics, its economy. Um, and also then even in a, in a micro scale, you've got to understand the city that you're thinking of investing. So I'll use Panama as an example and, and Cartagena I guess as a as a, a, a vice versa example, which in Panama, if you look at it right now, you know there's a lot of building going on, and you're right, you know condos have gone fairly expensive. A two bedroom apartment for rental right now will will probably will at least cost you a thousand dollars upwards a month, um, and you know for the higher end stuff you're looking at sort of two thousand upwards. So. There's a lot of apartments coming on board. You know, there's locals that can afford it, but obviously there's a high, a high population that can't afford such housing. So what they're really building here now is for the people that are moving into this country. And the population is growing. And, and I don't just mean there's a lot of expats, obviously, from the U.S. coming into Panama, but... And the expats in the U.S. tend to be more, a lot more the retirees that are heading to other parts of the country. But Panama City is an influx of people coming from the surrounding Latin countries. Um, Colombia, there's a lot of people from Colombia moving here. Venezuela, obviously, with the issues it's having right now, has, um, uh, has brought a big influx of people moving in here. And these people are, are people that are, you know, the wealthier side, if you like, in their home countries, but are moving for one reason or another because of Panama's growth or because of situations in their their own country. Rentals, short term, I mean, there was a negative thing that happened in Panama City for short term for condo rentals, which is it's now by law, um, you can't rest, rent for less than 45 days. Um, and they've done that to sort of appease the hotel industry, if you like. However, there's still... So, people, so you can't yeah. put your condo on Airbnb, that's for sure. A exactly. There are still people doing it. I wouldn't recommend it, of course, because if they do catch you, you will be fined. Um, but there are people still doing it because it's hard to change their ways. But it's certainly some Something that the government are trying to tackle. And it's only in Panama City, it's not for the whole country. But that does put a, a damper on the short term. But there's a lot of people here as well. And, I, and I'll give you an example. I had a, a client here on Tuesday who I was touring around that asked me why they'd seen so many, or, or not so many, but they'd seen quite a lot of empty apartments in Panama City. 
Now, there's a number of reasons for that, but two of the main ones is that there are people that are, if you like, parking their money here due to the economic situations of their own country. And uh, jumping back to Venezuela, I'll use that as an example, there's a lot of people that, if they can get the money out of Venezuela, are putting it into a place, putting it into Panama, as they know Panama, you know, it's a Spanish-speaking country, many of them have visited here before, it's seen as a very progressive market, um, democratically political country that has a strong future. So a lot of them are buying apartments and they're buying them out in cash. And Argentinians as well, you know, a lot of people from Argentina are getting their money out. Um, and they're buying in cash. So it's not like, um, I'll, I'll use Florida as an example, not to pick on Florida, but when there was a lot of issues with Florida during the crash, um, you know, there was a lot of mortgaged homes in Florida. Uh, and that added to its woes. Panama generally, I mean, it is stepping up slightly, but you'll, as a foreigner especially, you, you know, the best you get here is 50% mortgage. Um, so there's a big outlay initially anyway, but there's a lot of people buying in cash, which means they're not in such a rush to rent these, and it is sustaining the price a little bit. I do think it'll have a bit of correction on the rentals here anyway, because it's natural, but the population is still growing, so there's a lot of opportunities. And in places like Cartagena, I mean, that has a massive population already. Um, there is a big demand for young professionals, for example. So again, it's about understanding your market. You know, if you're building or buying a condo a, a three or four bedroom, to use an, a, an example, a three or four bedroom condo, that might not be the best market right now in, in Cartagena. And in my opinion, things like studios, one bedrooms and a maximum sort of two bedrooms offer the best opportunity because the employment is stepping up in the middle class um, and beyond that of young professionals is increasing dramatically. And of course, they need housing um, and they're looking for very specific things. So it's important to understand your market and, and as you have done already, but boots on the ground is a key. You know, go, go to any place and see and feel it and touch it and try to understand the market a little bit more and do your research. You know, that's the best advice I can give Jason. Well, I'll certainly agree that boots on the ground matter a lot. <laughs> you yeah. know, there's no question about that. That, uh, you know, nothing can take the place of that. Not, not internet searches or anything. You know, it's just boots on the ground really, really do matter. But maybe you can convince me. As I mentioned before, I keep looking at properties overseas. I keep reading your stuff. I keep reading the stuff from other promoters and so forth. And I just... When, when you look at other countries, it seems like, okay, maybe this is just this great emerging market opportunity and things are potentially less expensive. I, I'm not quite sure about that, but we can, we can discuss that one. But these countries, they, none of them have multiple listing services, do they? I mean, I, I haven't been to one that does. It's all just, you know, you go to a broker and this guy has these properties and another guy has another set of properties. Right. Absolutely true. Yeah. I mean, they have one in Panama called Encuentra um, 24 or Encuentra 24. Um, but even then, I mean, the statistics I've seen, it offers, I think, something like 30 percent of actually available properties at any given time. So it helps. Is it ideal? No, it will help on finding some price comparisons, etc. in areas. And certainly you can find property on there. It is a pain, you know, and it, it is because these countries are emerging. It also means that the real estate brokers are somewhat behind and there isn't um, you know when I first got here I was surprised coming from London myself you know all of the big real estate companies in London real estate brokers like Foxton's etc um, all have massive listing sites where they've got thousands of properties at any given time and they've got everything they've got on there it doesn't work that way here uh, you know and the internet is far behind here there isn't as much focus on the internet it's starting to take off well the, um, the remember the MLS the multiple listing mm -hmm. service in the United States did not evolve from the internet. That was long yeah. before the internet. And of course, there are websites, you know, the, the difference is that the MLS is the official thing yeah. that, that, the, that the entire brokerage industry in the U.S. uses. There, of course, you know, individual brokers can have websites. Some brokerages are very large and they have lots of listings on them, but that's still not the MLS. Yeah. And, and it's important to note, you know, this is something that has helped the US system is the fact that you are fully licensed brokers. You know, anyone in, in the US that is a real estate broker has to have fully licensed. Even in the UK, you don't have to be licensed. Uh, 
So it might surprise people that it's not everywhere. It's not a norm. With that, it means there's a bit of chaos. And, you know, there's a bit of chaos even in the UK. But in places like Panama, there's even more chaos because the growth is exponential. You know, everything's going at 100 miles an hour, while the infrastructure in terms of things like this is still moving at five miles an hour. So it, it's 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 about catch up, you know, it's in its infancy. I'm sure they'll get there one day, but we're, we're quite a few years away from that now. There are certain places that are better than others. You know, I do find that Panama is a bit wild west when it comes to real estate brokerage um, firms. The, you know, in, in Colombia, it's a bit easier, um, but you still always have to really, um, you know, there's no option, but you've got to speak to 20, 30 different companies and see what opportunities they have. Um, it's a pain. I wish I could say there is an easy way. Unfortunately, there just isn't. Hopefully, you know, that's part of what we do is, for our readers at least, is to help them with that search by, we, we wouldn't be brokers of finding you an individual home. Um, you know, if you're looking to see apartments in different buildings across the city, it's not re really where we come in. But certainly working with credible developers is where we do come in and doing due diligence on them. But but, but, but so, so let me tell you why that MLS thing concerns me. You know, you say it's a, the Wild West, and mm -hmm. I agree with you, it is. It's that way in Australia, even more modern countries like, uh, you know, Australia, they don't have an MLS system. At least they didn't when I was there last. You go to this broker, you got that. You go to that broker, you got that. And what concerns me about that is that the whole concept of uh, real estate is that, you know, there are three approaches to value. There's replacement cost approach, there's the income approach, and but that's only used for larger income properties in the U.S., meaning over four units. But really then, it's still the third one, which is comparison, the most commonly used approach to value. And if you can't look it up on a centralized database that is cooperative, that different brokers use, that they come to, you know, as a community and use, it concerns me that the the concept of value is very hard to determine. It becomes very subjective. It becomes unknown. Yeah. No, I agree. And, and unfortunately, that is one of the issues. And I'll give you an example of that. I, I do know cases of, especially in the interior of Panama, where, um, you know, people have gone to, and it's not just locals, I should add that as well. There's a lot of Americans that are coming in here, Europeans that are opening brokerage, brokerage and sort of joining in the chaos, if you like. Um, so an example is a, a client went out and looked at a property and the broker had said, um, that the property, I can't remember but how much it was specifically, but let's say it was a house and it, the broker had said 230000 Eventually, they managed to have a, a, a conversation with the actual owner through someone they'd met locally in the town. And they met with the owner and the owner said, yeah, I'm selling it for 200000 So where has that 30000 come from? In all honesty, and I hate to say it because I don't mean to give Panama a bad name, but it's come from the broker putting on an extra chunk for himself. Yeah. So we call, what we call that in the uh, in the business in the U.S. is we call that a net listing, okay? Yes. Where the seller says to the broker, "Hey, look, I want a hundred thousand dollars. Whatever you can get over that, it's all yours." That's called a net listing, and almost nobody does it because it's so rife for problems and angry people and litigation. You know, exactly. It's just, exactly. it's just nobody wants to do net listings. Okay. They, you know, usually do a typical exclusive right listing. The seller and the broker agree on the price and then they agree on the commission that will be paid to the broker too. And that's usually just a percentage of the price. So it's pretty simple. And, and, you know, one could argue, Hey, well, the broker is always going to try to get the highest price and that's good for the seller, but it's not good for the buyer. But really, it's not that significant because it's such a small marginal difference. I mean, if they're getting a 6% commission and they sell the house for $10,000 more, it's 600 bucks gross. And that's before it's all cut up between yeah. the broker and the agent and the other broker that's cooperating in the deal. And it ends up to be uh, not that much money. Okay. Yeah. They, exactly. They'd rather sell more volume than make a little more money on each deal usually. Yeah, 
yeah, most definitely. Uh, but the difficulty is, I mean, they do have, uh, you know, using Panama as an example again, there's the, um, the government entity called um, ACODECO, which is for consumer rights. So there are some ofif- official things that people should be doing, such as you should be working with a registered broker. Um, when you, let's take rentals, for example, when you're renting an apartment, really a, a, a representative from ACODECO should come to the apartment paid for by the landlord landlord and oversee the inventory check and everything else in case there's any disputes at the end. The problem is, it's great the system's there, but there's very little people using it. So I'm sure this will get better over time. Unfortunately, the government have tried to put these systems in place, but it takes time, you know, and, and, and there's so much going on in these emerging markets that it's hard for the government really to try and control everything and improve it as quickly as they want. Yeah, and the, go- the governments have, uh, you know, too much corruption and they have, they have limited resources. It, yeah. It's just, uh, you know, these are just older, more primitive places than the U.S. The U.S. is just more advanced in this kind of stuff. And for better or worse, it's not all good in the U.S. Believe yeah. me, the U.S. has tons of problems. I'm not, I'm not being a big apologist for the U.S. here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the, but the flip side to that is when you find good opportunities in emerging markets, they can be some of the best opportunities in the world. So know? why is that? Tell us about that. Because the markets are growing so much, there's still, an, uh, and I'll use my home city, London example, you know, rental yields in London right now and central London and then you're, if you're getting 4%, you're doing quite well. If you're getting 6%, you're doing amazing. Um, okay, so explain how that's calculated just for the listeners because rental yield is not something that's used in the U.S. Most people just use cash on cash return. They use right. cap rates. They use overall return on investment, which I think in residential real estate is m- much more actually legitimate than cap rates because cap rates don't include... Uh, enough information. It's too simplistic. Yeah, exactly. So in, in simple terms, and we do keep it fairly simple in England, so a rental yield is the annual return you're getting from the rent that is a percentage of your purchase price. So for example, if you paid $100,000 for an apartment, then if someone says they're getting 4% rental yield, that means they're getting $4,000 a year rent. So very simple. We, we don't like to go too deep in economics and mathematics in England. <laughs> <laughs> which is shown by our terrible situation right now economically. But anyway, that's another conversation. But, you know, so rental yield wise, and that's what I'm referring to, you know, you can get 4% in place like London. The capital appreciation is even lower. You know, there's not, there is capital appreciation, but you have to get find the needle in the haystack to get great capital appreciation. But in a place like Panama, I mean, for example, and I, I don't mean to keep harping on Panama, it's just that I'm based here, so it's an easy um, ruler for me to use. But, you know, Panama City, you, you can buy bad properties and you can buy overpriced properties, but generally you're buying into a good market. So I do believe that capital appreciation will keep on going up and up. And, what, and this is an important factor to make, you know, and, and people get scared of this. You do get corrections in emerging markets. It doesn't well, you get corrections it, everywhere. Exactly. And, and that's one of the reasons I just don't like investing for capital appreciation at all. I just, I've just gotten too conservative <laughs> seeing all these deals over the, so many years. And I, I just think you just got to be a cash flow investor. You know, exactly. maybe it's my age. I don't know. No, uh, I, you know, cash flow is pretty predictable. You, I'm sure you'd agree with that. Yeah, a hundred percent. And what I'll say to that is, when we work with income generating investments in real estate, there's one of our stipulations is that the developers can never include capital appreciation in in their basis for projections of returns. Because because I'm like you, you know, if you get capital appreciations, great. But no one can really predict what capital appreciation has got to be or where it's going to go. You can predict the near future of of yields, but you can't really factor in capital appreciation, especially over an extended period of time. Yeah, so, but on the rental yield side, if we're going to talk about just rental yields, you know, you can find quite quite easily, I don't say very, very easily, but you can find rental yields of certainly above 7% in Panama City. Okay, so and the calculation, explain it. So a $100,000 property, you'd be getting $7,000 a year um, in rental returns. In gross income? Yes, in gross okay. income. Yes, so, sorry, so that means that a $100,000 property produces $7,000 per year 
and divide that by 12 to see the monthly income. Now, see, what, what are the association fees on a property like that? Very, it, it, it differs depending on the time. I know. It's a very hard question for me to answer, but they range from sort of, I mean, on a property like that, they could be anywhere from $50 a month to 150 It depends on the quality. But on $100,000... That, that's all? Only, yeah. only $100 a month for a condo? Yeah, on a condo of that price point, that's about right. You, I mean, in the you know in the in the higher term properties, and I'm talking sort of the Trump buildings, etc. Of course, you're paying higher. Um, you know, you'd be looking at on a two bedroom condo, you'll be looking at two fifty up to three fifty a month. I would say as a guesstimate, um, but it's not as high as I, I, I don't know the states inside out, and I don't want to try and guess what the fees are. But it's not as high, I believe, from clients that I've spoken with as the US is, for example, um, it's fairly uh, lower here. But this in a, brings up an important point as well here, Jason, and, and this is something that I think so many investors don't consider when they should when they're looking at rental returns. And, and right now we're talking about physical condos and houses, but is who are the management company that look after that uh, condo building afterwards? And, and there is a complete difference of service here. And I've seen it time and time again where investors have bought in a condo building and then the service has been atrocious. The paint starts wearing off yeah, on the yeah, outside yeah, of the yeah. building. Problem, yeah. Problems galore. Okay. Exactly. So, you know, but here's the thing. In the U.S., investors can get 1% of the rental, 1% of the price per month in the right places. And that means the rental yield, instead of being 10% or 7%, as you suggested, would be 12% because they'd be getting $1,000 per month on that $100,000 property or 12000 per year versus 7000 per year. So now please convince me as to the, the value of doing something overseas where you've got you know, you've got this whole different situation. You've got a, a different set of laws. You've got the Wild West, as you mentioned. You've got a lower rental yield. Now, now the association fees are probably lower on that condo. And I'm going to ask you about condos next because that's a whole other subject, condos versus single-family homes. But where do you make it? I mean, I know that for a while they had a property tax moratorium in Panama. That was kind of a neat deal. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that it's important to note, first of all, that when I say 7%, that's sort of the starting level. So it's 7% upwards. I mean, people that are getting the right deals can be getting as high as 15%, maybe higher a year, but that's fine, the right deals. It's also important to note that there's good deals everywhere. You know, there's no such thing as a, well, there's such thing as a bad investment in property, don't get me wrong, but there's no such thing as a, a, the worst place to invest. There is a difference between value and different types of properties in a certain area. But, you know, and I get asked by clients about places like Spain, also about the US, and what's my view on the property market? And my answer is all that was the same, that if you can find the right property in the right country anywhere, it will do well. It's about finding that right property and seeing how much opportunity there is to get those sort of properties. So there are good opportunities, but... The Wild West side is really dealing with the brokers. From beyond that point, so once you've got ownership of, of a property, it isn't Wild West here. You know, it's very secure. They have systems, like you say, property taxes, land taxes, etc., in Brazil that allow people to have security of assets. And I would say another side that's important that we get asked a lot is um, in Panama, rights of ownership for foreigners. Firstly, there's parts of Panama that is rights of possession, and these, those have already been stipulated, usually based around the Kuna Indians, so the natives of Panama, the areas of the country that they predominantly are based in. Never go for rights of possession is my personal view. There are some people that are going for it and then flipping it into titles. I don't like it. It's very What does that mean? I don't even understand what that so is. So rights of possessions means that you, you have the rights of the property, but you don't actually have the physical title of the land in your name. So... It means that you are given a right to use that property and you, you can do what you want with it, the same as if you, you own a property outright. However, if someone wanted to change something like the government, for example, then if it's rights of possession, they can actually change it slightly from, from if you have the full ownership rights, they could make different changes to your property than if you owned it outright. So well, I think that's one of the things that people really get concerned about with foreign countries in general is that regardless of that rights of possession issue, they, they just don't feel, you know, Americans feel pretty secure in rule of law. Of course, there have been big scandals in Mexico where 
the government has just come in and said, hey, look, we're going to just take this land back. You know, if you were to invest in China and the government wants to build it, that's, that's the great efficiency of communism, isn't it? You know, yeah. the government can just do what they want. And there is the, therein lies the difference between China and India. And the central planning has a bit of an argument, as much as I don't like it philosophically. But there's a, there, are, there are some ways in which it's a lot more efficient. Yeah, no, I agree. And, you know, there's a, there's a long discussion that can be had about that. But um, I certainly think that um, places, you know, in, in Panama, again, it, it's based itself on the US system, really. Um, so for a start, all foreign, and that's the point I was going to make, is all, all foreign ownership here is you have the same rights as a local. So there's no difference. And of course, there is a fear that comes into people's minds. What if someone wants to take my property back, etc.? Well, the way I answer that is in countries like Panama, there's as much chance of someone taking your property away as there is in your home country. You know, because if a democratic system changes and becomes a dictatorship then you know that could happen anywhere do i expect it to happen here no you know and they have debates we've got the elections coming up in may and they're having debates on tv and everything else here i mean it's very little different from the us other than the fact that it's in spanish but it's the same you know same political scenario etc on new houses and stuff as well just going back to that property taxes point on new houses i believe it's 20 years but it's tax exempt for on new houses um, whether you build it or buy it so on houses, I believe up to, I can't remember the exact amount of years, but you, well, basically it's up to those 20 years. So if you were to buy one that was five years old, then you'd have 15 years left of, um, of no taxes, property taxes on it. So there are tax um, incentives here for buying um, property, but, you know, there's not a lot of historical building here. So in the city, especially everything is pretty new. So there are some freedoms in that way. What I would say, and this goes back to a point that we, we kind of um, touched on earlier and we both agreed that it's not something we consider in an investment. However, it is important to note that if I compare it to London, you know, London's already very, very expensive for property, central London, um, extremely expensive. Place like Panama, you can come in at a lower level and there is potentially an opportunity for capital appreciation to be better than especially somewhere like London. Now, well, in all fairness, though, I mean, London and Panama? Come on. Yeah. Right? <laughs> That's a pretty big stretch. I mean, you know, you're talking about the, the financial capital of the entire planet, you yeah. know, many people would say is London, okay? <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, whether it be London, New York, or Geneva, I don't know, but <laughs> London's up there for sure. Yeah, but, but I mean, even places, okay, let's use a different example than Singapore, you know, that's been a very booming um, housing market for some time. One of my old colleagues actually um, was in Singapore recently and, 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 you know, and was saying how there's a lot of people in Singapore now looking to get their money away from Singapore rather than, he's based in Singapore. Um, rather oh, than, really? I'm, I'm on my way to Singapore in uh, about a month and a half, so I'm glad you're telling me this. What, oh, well, there you go. What, uh, yeah, that surprises me because I just I just keep hearing Jim Rogers, uh, who's been on my show a couple of times, uh, the famous Jim Rogers, uh, you know, author, investor, etc. And he keeps promoting Singapore like it's there's just no tomorrow, like it's don't, the best place ever. Don't get me wrong. I think there's a lot of opportunity in Singapore. But what I mean is the market for real estate has become expensive. You know, yeah. it's gone up in price dramatically over the last sort of five years, maybe longer, and it keeps going up. So it is pulling people, not pulling people out of the market, but it's limiting, if you like, a little bit of one, the budget of people investing into markets, but also the viability of there are some people. And again, this is just how people feel and everyone's different. But there are some people that are saying, well, I don't believe there's going to be as much capital appreciation because the boom has really happened in Singapore. And will it carry on? How long can it go for? Is it going to have a correction for a few years or what's going to happen? So that's what I mean of, and I, and I should say that I think everyone's portfolio, investment portfolio should be that diverse, that it's spread across different countries um, for security, not just for, for income and, and profit, but also for security of your portfolio. And, you know, your, your portfolio really, unless you've got made every single investment 100% correct 100% of the time should be changing somewhat at times and that's where you start moving for different markets you know and I've got clients that are doing that they're invested in certain countries and then now they feel that that country may have reached its plateau and they're moving it into another country so 
it's it's about individuals you know you've got to assess a lot of things you've got to assess risk and everything else but i think there's a lot of opportunity and i'm glad you mentioned jim rogers because uh, you know i know of jim rogers quite well and i had the opportunity to meet to meet him and speak with on stage with him actually at um a show in San Francisco some time back um, on agriculture and um, Jim Rogers you know big advocate of agriculture I'm a big advocate of agriculture a lot of my portfolio not all of it but a certainly a high percentage is in agriculture and the reason being for that is I think that you can get right now a better return from an income perspective in agriculture than property and I don't mean all property and I know people are going to say well that's not true I'm getting this etc but I'm just talking about generalization obviously of an investment category but agriculture I like it a lot again capital appreciation don't even think about it um, whether you own the titles land or not or doing leasehold but I would say go for the title ownership but don't include capital appreciation but from an income perspective if you're investing in the right projects you know you can get very good returns in agriculture and it's a global market and some of your fears that you mentioned earlier about well what if the local market changes how do I know people are going to rent this how do I know people are going to want to go into my condo that I've just bought well that's where agricultural difference where if it's the right type of agricultural investment really it's reliant on a global food value as opposed to a local food value if it's being done correctly and i don't mean always but i mean for example in panama and this is why i like the mangoes they've got the canal here so they could send these off to anywhere export them um, to different countries depending on current situation but generally prices in food are dictated by the global demand not by a local demand yeah i i mean i get all those macro trends of course and yeah. i agree with them and i know jim rogers is a big agriculture fan but there's so many micro details when it comes down to really you know executing something. I mean, when you, you guys do these uh, agricultural things, people buy a piece of real estate that's part of a bigger whole. This yep. is my understanding of it. And then they have it managed by a manager, just like a property manager in a residential property. And But this manager is responsible for planting crops and getting them to market and selling them. And there, there are you're susceptible to just a whole another bunch of issues that you got to know about. <laughs> you know? Of course, of yeah. course. Yeah. I, you know, I mean, there are, there are droughts, there are plagues, there are insects, there are things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and there are bad managers who rip you off, you yeah. know? <laughs> so there's all of this stuff. And, you know, that's what your company does is it uh, ostensibly vets these, uh, these investments. And, and that's a heck of a lot better than going in alone without knowing anything. I will, I will give you that a million times over. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and obviously, you know, you've built a reputation and, and you care about that reputation. And, and so, so, you know, that's, uh, that's important. Yeah. And there's always there's always risks and, you know, and agriculture has its own unique risks. But again, you know, you can mitigate some of those risks, at least by location. Um, you know, where is the location of, of what you're investing in? What is the local market? Who are they going to be selling to? And really, you've got to do and, and this is where we you know do this on behalf of our clients but if a client wants to carry on that due diligence we encourage it but we'll certainly provide you what we found which is who is this developer what's their history what have they done what do they have up and running who are they selling to now do they have that market there will they be able to sell it a good developer in agriculture has all this in place or at least has the plan in place and can give you the details of it and it, and it's like property there's good developers there's bad developers it's about doing as much legwork as you can to find the right ones. And then, you know, we've all got to make that bit of leaf of the faith when it comes to any investing, unfortunately. Yeah. Let me ask you before you go, and I'm sorry to keep you so long, James, you're just, you know, really chock full of information here. Uh, about the condo thing, I'm not crazy about condos. You know, there are just so many outside forces. You know, I, I just like buying single family homes and apartment buildings. But, but why is it that whenever I look overseas, everything, it, almost everything is about condo condominiums. It's like, who, does anybody sell any detached homes in these countries? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a good question. Um, and I feel your pain. And, and I have to say, that's why my most recent um, investment in Panama, uh, well, actually was an agriculture one, but the one before that was a house. And the reason I bought a house is because it's near to the city. And I must say, I live in this house, but I'm also viewing it as an investment, is because there is a lack of houses. There's a lot of condos, like you say, but there's not many developers building houses. Why? Pure and simple developers can make more money from building condos than they can from building houses, unless it's very high end. So, for example, there is a person building Santa Maria Golf Course um, just outside Panama City, which is a Nicholas Golf Course, and he's building houses around that. But obviously, you're talking about homes 
that are hitting the one million dollar mark um, and costs that are less. Dave. Oh, that that uh, that's no. I'm I'm talking. Why can't why can't I just buy the kind of investment property I buy in the U.S. Whether it be Texas, Georgia, Indiana. I can do great deals. I can buy these hundred thousand dollar single family homes. They're only five, ten years old, and wow, they just they rent for a thousand bucks a month. No problem. Yeah, I mean, firstly, you've got to consider, Jason, that you know the U.S. has a lot more space than most countries. Yeah, um, okay, that's interesting point. It's a, yeah. it's a very big country. A place like Panama is limited in land mass, but even with that, I agree that there does seem to be this philosophy of building upwards rather than outwards. But that being said. That's in the central, in the other areas across the Las Americas Bridge, for example, they are building these small houses, these gated communities. I live in a gated community the other way towards the airport, um, and that's the house I bought. Now, for my house, and I'm happy to share this, you know, I bought it for $250,000. Um, and why did I buy that house? Because I think it's an area that's going to increase. The golf course is going in across the road from me, and I think there's going to be a good opportunity to make money there. So there are opportunities. You have to find them, but there are opportunities. Outside of the city, they are building houses and they're building a lot of purpose-built houses for the low to middle income level of Panamanians. So again, making sure that they've got that end market, which is something we discussed earlier, where is the need? But they are, but there is a lot of condos going up. And the only way I can honestly say, is there a thought process and reasoning behind it? Not really other than they will say that it's due to people liking the security of it and the amenities, not amenities, but the maintenance, everything else is centralized. But really it's about developers making more profit from building upwards than they would outwards because land is expensive, you know, and it gets more and more expensive as time goes on, especially in major cities. But outside of the cities, housing is not an issue. You know, you can buy houses and even on the beach town areas like Coronado, where they do have condo towers, but there's a lot of housing opportunities to buy there as well. So it's relevant to the city. And it is like, I'd say most cities build that way, really, um, centrally, at least is upwards rather than outwards, but they are building more and more. It's just in this specific part of the city or this city itself, it's quite hard um, to get those sort of house opportunities. But outside the city, there's plenty of them. Yeah, I would just love to get some single single family homes that are, yeah. you know, I mean, I remember reading with International Living uh, years ago about single family homes you could buy in Eastern European countries like Romania for $30,000 and you get this chateau and <laughs> it was yeah. like nothing like that in real life. It was just, yeah. Yeah. You you know? can't, if you can't build for it, then I would worry about what you're going to get at the end. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, <laughs> that's very interesting. Very interesting point. And the reason I don't like I, that, that I'm just not crazy about condos is that there's so much what I call intermediary party risk. You know, you have to deal with this homeowners association. You've got neighbors, you've got, you know, if the neighbor above you has their pipe leak, it affects you and everything just becomes so complex <laughs> yeah yeah no i agree but then there's the, the flip side jason is that you know there's an area in panama called chame and they've now caught the people but for a long time there was a lot of expats with homes there and for for about a year really there was quite a lot of burglaries now not harmful burglaries it was when people were away but, you know, it's easier to break into a house that has a bit of land around it. Than oh, it I agree. Building a condo building. So I agree. Yeah. There's flip sides to both, but it's, it's about choice and what people want, really, and, and, and where's the market for them. And condos sometimes, for, even for people coming to the city, you know, the, the, the executive level people, I would say, that come into the city, they want condos. That's what they want to rent um, because it's not their only home. And it's generally just based on the fact that their business dictates they need to be here. Um, and a lot of people in Panama, for example, you know, Panamanians and, and foreigners that are here have a, a, a condo in the city and a house at the beaches. Well, what, so, I, what, I, what I have just found is that the concept of suburbia, which in America is a pretty great investment, generally, of course, that's a very general statement, is just not done in other countries. You know, the suburbia concept is is kind of like an American concept. And I guess it started back east with uh, what's it called, Levittown. And, you know, in the post-World War II baby boomers, and you see a lot of this stuff in Long Beach and Lakewood, California. You know, you just see these suburbs. And the suburbs are not expensive, but they're fairly close to the city. You know, so it's sort of, it's just sort of interesting how... Uh, 
that kind of development style just doesn't really happen around the world like it does in the U.S. Yeah, I'd say, yeah, depending on the country, but there's certainly places like Panama where it, it, there, there isn't as much of that going on. And I, and I do honestly believe that a lot of that is because of the price of land. Yeah, um, right. It, it's just, it's very expensive for them to actually implement something like that. I live in a gated community. It's great. There's, they've just finished another section of it. So there's probably about five, 600 houses in that gated community. I really like it. Kids are going around the streets, you know, it's safe and we've got security, but Panama's safe anyway, but it add, adds an extra safe to it. But, you know, I like that. There are that. And, and, and I like living there. I lived in a condo in the city for a year when I first arrived. And, and after a year, myself and my girlfriend just decided we wanted a house, you know, so, so we went and got a house. You can find them, but it's the cost really and, and the land price that's stopping developers or encouraging them from doing it on a, on a bigger basis. Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense to me. Well, uh, James, you really answered a lot of uh, these uh, potential objections that people have in their mind. They may not even be saying them to you, but I, I'm sure they're thinking them. And so thank you for doing that. That's been uh, very informative. Give out your website, tell people where they can find you and the properties and so forth. Sure. It's um, www.liveandinvestoverseas.com. Um, and you can also email me at jarcher, A-R-C-H-E-R, at liveandinvestoverseas.com. So Happy to help in any way I can. And thanks for having me on the show, Jason. It was thoroughly enjoyable. Fantastic. Well, James Archer, good talking to you. You too. Have you listened to the Creating Wealth series? I mean, from the beginning. If not, you can go ahead and get book one that shows one through 20 in digital download. These are advanced strategies for wealth creation. For more information, go to jasonhartman.com. This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company, all rights reserved. For distribution or publication rights and media interviews, please visit www.hartmanmedia.com or email media at hartmanmedia.com. Nothing on this show should be considered specific personal or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own, and the host is acting on behalf of Platinum Properties Investor Network, Inc., exclusively.